Wow, there's a bunch of you here today, huh? This is awesome. I got a question for you, though. Why do they always put the old guy first? Is it, is it so if he expires, somebody can come up and just take his notes or something? <laughs> it's the hair. <laughs> well, the, you know, the glare of the hair. What did you... <laughs> um, hey, it's kind of interesting. Um, the, the section that I have in war games is um, uh, the war is real. And um, for many of you that have walked with the Lord any length of time, you realize that there is really a, a war that's going on out there. Uh, but for some, it takes a while to find out. And I want to I tell you about some, uh, after we read, I want to tell you what the Lord has shown me um, in, in my lifetime. And actually, the spiritual war is going on right now. Um, my, uh, my tablet that I teach from every, day, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every time I teach, it's uh, not coming on. So, so here's where we go, spiritual war. Brothers, let's pray. Uh, Father, we want to thank you, and we want to give you praise for uh, just bringing these men here that we can uh, study a very important um, topic, and particularly as being heads of household, that we take our rightful place, and uh, we become the leaders of our household, and we, be able, we would draw close to you, Lord, so that we, we could truly... Uh, be able to withstand in this evil day that we live in. So we just want to praise you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 6, and we're going to read uh, 10 through 13, and then we, will, um, then we will comment on it. It says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in, heavenly, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. I want to share with you, um, in 1969, I was a young man, and um, I was in the United States Army, and I, I was called to go to Vietnam. And as I was reading this, I thought, you know, uh, these, these four verses here somewhat outline uh, what we want to speak to today, but it also parallels what the army would do to get a soldier ready uh, to go into battle or to go and serve in a battle zone. Um, it's interesting that as uh, I got my orders for Vietnam, and many of you have served in respect, and you've gone into um, you've gone into war zones where you'd never been before, and you wonder what's going to happen. Uh, to me, war was conceptual. It was just something a concept. You really couldn't understand what it might be like until you actually were there on the ground. And even if you weren't were a, a combat veteran, but even if you were in support, the war I was in, it was everywhere. You didn't know where it would come out. It was no matter whether you were in a base camp, um, things would happen, but it was a concept at first. And at 19 years old, it's like, well, you know, to some, war sounds glamorous. To s <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It does, but, uh, but when, when you get to the real deal, the whole, everything changes for you. But I started to awaken um, during my training, <clears throat> and that's where it got interesting here, is because, you know, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, what, they're, they, what the army was doing, they wanted you to be strong. And anybody, whether you, whatever service you were in, you know that, man, you ran. You ran everywhere. We didn't get trucked anywhere. 
We had seven miles each way to the rifle range, and that wasn't an exaggeration. And if we were ahead of time, they would make you get down and low crawl until you were on time. And it was a really, it, it was quite an experience. But they wanted to prepare you mentally and physically. And you know, when we, um, when we, we, we say, you know, we really need to walk with God. But you know what, when you're in training, you run with God. You run with God. And <clears throat> that's, what, that's what happened in my own life, preparing to go to Vietnam. Now, I'm going to refer back to that. That's kind of a picture of what happened to me. So the first thing was um, we're being, we're, we were getting in condition. We were getting in shape because uh, there potentially would be a lot of running and a lot of lifting, and uh, it, was, uh, it was very rigorous. And as a young man, you wonder why. Well, you know, as we went through our training and all that, and you got closer to the date, and I got orders that actually said Vietnam on it, it became more and more and more of a reality. And uh, I'd be lying to say if I, I thought, yes, I'm ready for this, because I wasn't exactly ready for this. It was, it's something that you just, when, when it happens, then you, you actually have a lot of on-the-job training. When my wife's name is Glenda, as uh, some of you know, know uh, Glenda and I, but when Glenda and I were young Christians, and um, we, we lived in a neighborhood in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, which is a suburb of uh, Albuquerque, and it was an area that was known for real darkness. And when I say darkness, I mean uh, there was satanic covens that operated on the outskirts of the city out in the desert. I, I know that sounds surreal because most people don't understand or know about these things. And to tell you the truth, I never wanted to find out. But one day, a lady from the cross the street came to Gwenda. And keep in mind, Gwenda and I were both young Christians. And uh, I was a young, reluctant Christian as a husband. You know, I, I always lagged behind. Anybody like that? Did you ever lag behind your wife? My wife was really, man, she was running. And I was saying, wait, I want to catch up to you. But I, I'm so thankful that I had a wife like that that challenged me. But a neighbor came that we didn't know, moved in. And she came in, and she, she threw down a Bible on our coffee table, and Glenda and her were alone, and she says, I want to know about this. And she was very firm about it. And uh, Glenda said, I was like deer in the headlights, because, okay, what do you want to know? <laughs> we're young Christians. <laughs> and, um, and Glenda said, well, what do you mean? She goes, well... I have been a priestess in, a, in a, a high priestess in a coven, a satanic coven. And she said, and I've been, I think they want to kill me. And they, I, I'm trying to get out. And I want to know, I want to know about the Lord. And um, Glenda thought, I don't know that much. I mean, all I know is I'm saved. And, um, but oddly enough, a few weeks before, the Lord moved in next door to us, a couple. We didn't know them very well. And as we got to know them, they, I referred to them as those holy rollers. <laughs> they, were, they were holy rollers. And actually, the, the man uh, was the one who had actually led me to the Lord uh, in a, a rather radical way. And we, that's a different story. But those two discipled Gwenda and I, um, early on, and um, so when this lady came and said, I want out of the satanic coven, we went to Scott and Gale, and, and Gwenda witnessed this woman's deliverance, and it was, there was a lot of, a lot of weird things, and if I explained it to you, some of you will say, yeah, I know what you mean, and others say, that sounds too crazy. Um, and without going into great, great detail, that's, that's where we ended up. Uh, she got saved, 
And she was rough on the edges, and like most of us have been when we got saved, I had come out of, I, I made my money playing in bars. I was a professional musician, and, um, and I was really rough around the edges. But, you know, it's just an amazing testimony that um, God can use those of us that came to him rough around the edges. But um, all of a sudden, the reality of a spiritual warfare, and for Christians, I want, I want to say this, that when you said yes to Jesus and he became your savior, a target went up on your back. It illuminated on your back. And, um, and we, we actually experience spiritual warfare all the time. Now, some of us easily recognize it, and some of us don't recognize it. But, and I'm not saying that everything is created by Satan, because we create our own trials at times. But it's, but it's really cool. We have a God that will take us through these. And, um, Okay, so as this story continues, um, this woman got saved. It was a rather radical way. And um, shortly after that, I came home from work one day and there was a note on my garage door. And on the garage door, I, I thought, I had a daughter that was maybe 12, 13 years old, and you know, you think it's boys in the neighborhood. I opened it up, and much to my surprise, it was a death threat. There was a pentagram, and on the pentagram was a woman lying on it, and the woman lying on it had a dagger through the heart, and according to the police, it was a real drop of blood. Now, the, I guess, you know, they didn't use DNA back in 1960 uh, or the early 70s that much. But it was, um, the police didn't want to do anything about it. We went, we went to our pastor, and I'm, in all fairness, I, I won't name the uh, denomination. Went to our pastor, and he says, well, I've got a book about that. And it's like, uh, we went to friends, and they said, ah, oh, you don't need to worry about that. And I'm thinking, well, there's a death threat on somebody in my family. And so we started reading, and we started reaching out to people that seemed to have some knowledge about it, and we were in the midst of being trained up for war. Now, I'm going to regress just a, a little bit here, and I'll finish this story. God was going to use this as a training ground for us, and um, I'm thankful for that now. But at the time... It was terrifying. <laughs> Honestly, it was. But you know, when, when, we, when we look at the Word of God, we see that um, it's, you wonder, okay, as a Christian, why would I have an enemy? Well, the logical answer is because, you know, that man is, a, is God's special creation. And Satan hates God. And Satan hates his, God's creation. And in particular, Satan hates righteousness. So the target on our back becomes more into focus because you men are Christians. And if you're not Christians here, can I invite you in? Because you don't want to miss the battle. It's awesome. And I'm not lying. Because once, once you get trained up and you recognize and you know what to do, victory is eminent. Victory is there. And it's his victory. But so we've got this real war. And I didn't know that there was this real warfare that was going on, that it was spiritual. It wasn't anything that you could take on yourself. It was spiritual. So in verse 10, it shows us that we need to train for battle. In verse 11, and here's our outline, it needs, we need to prepare for battle. And that's different than training. And I'll tell you why when we get there. And in verse 12, we need to know the enemy. You need to know the enemy. And then in verse 13, we need to take up our swords. But 
here Glenda and I were as young Christians, and uh, we, we kind of fell into this. And God maybe, I, when I read Job, I thought, Lord, are you, uh, are, is, this, is this something that we need to, uh, you're, you're showing our faithfulness in this way? And I thought, gosh, because I don't know whether, <laughs> I, it, was a, it was a difficult trial. And by the way, this was six weeks, this, we got this six weeks before what the world calls Halloween, but what is the fall solstice that tends to be um, a high holiday, the high holiday for satanic worshipers. Now, I know you probably didn't come here to expect to hear things like this, but you know what, when it, I told Tim uh, last night, I said, you know when you said the war was real, um, it's really, it was really something that I could relate to because I did, had no idea this is a real war. Spiritual warfare is real. Spiritual warfare is serious. And spiritual warfare is throughout this world. But spiritual warfare is nothing we should shy away from. Spiritual warfare is the time to get strong. So as we, um, this went on for, like I say, nearly another, a month. Now here was, the, here was the hard thing for us. Glenda and I were a blended family. I was a single dad raising two children when I got married, when we got married, and she was a single mom raising three children. And the, the, their, uh, our children's other parents, they were, they were present and they, were, they would see them every other week. But we couldn't let them out of our sight. And so we had to, we, had to under, we thought, how are we gonna do this? And we had two challenges. They ranged from, I don't know at the time, probably five years old to 12 years old. We have five kids. They're active, they wanna do things. How do we keep them close to us so we can protect them, so we can watch over them? Well, Gwenda drove them to school, drove them home, she went to the store, she took all five with them, and in that, in that time frame, in that whole six week period, not one of them complained about going with her. And it was really a miracle because any of you raised young children, they complain about everything. They're like the children of Israel, right? <laughs> and they're like the children of the United States of America. <laughs> we complain about everything. But uh, that, was, that was one of the miracles. The second miracle is for all that time frame, there should have, their, their other parents should have seen them three to four times. They always had something else going. So we had them there that whole time. And it was, and we had prayed about that. Lord, you've got to help us here. You've got to help us. Here's how crazy it was. I said I didn't know anything about spiritual warfare. I got out the anointing oil. I was going around anointing doors and windows and things like that. I said I wasn't going to get into detail. I can't help it. I'm sorry. Uh, but some of the details were some of the weird stuff that was happening is our neighbor's cat, the Holy Roller's cat, had, uh, had this thing that he would fling himself against our picture window that looked out into our backyard, and he would keep flinging himself against it, flinging himself at it. He wanted in. You open the door, and this cat came in, and I'd throw it out. And he kept flinging himself against the window. Well, they lived next door. That's where he got fed. What was that all about? It seems like this cat was doing intelligence for <laughs> the enemy. Uh, and actually, when we took the cat and said, we don't know what's wrong with your cat, his whiskers had been totally shaved off on one side, and she said, that's a sign of an incantation. And we're going, how do you know all this stuff? Who are you people? <laughs> you know? <laughs> it, it's, and I know that this sounds like it's uh, straight out of... Uh, uh, well, most of you don't remember uh, the Twilight Zone, but uh, the Twilight Zone. It's straight out of the Twilight Zone type of uh, thing, but it was happening to us, and we could hardly believe it. The, so that was one thing. The other thing was is that we had things going on middle of the night in our home, like the reeking of, of um, 
It was like B.O. It was a rank smell to where I was hiding in the closet one night, smelling clothes, trying to figure out where's this smell coming from? You couldn't put your finger on it. And, um, and my wife was actually Mrs. Queen. So the house was queen, the clothes were queen. The only, the only one was me and I, and, I, and I worked in an office and I didn't, I didn't perspire so it was, uh, it, was, it was pretty strange. But you know, about two weeks before Halloween, it had been almost a month, uh, one morning we were, um, it was a Saturday morning, we woke and, you know, we were praying and crying together because we were worn out and we were, we were just worried to death. And I laid there while my wife went to shower and um, as I was laying there and praying, the Lord gave me a vision. And I'm not one that I get visions. So uh, out of my whole life, there's maybe been a few times, but this was, this was an amazing one. Um, the Lord showed me from a bird's eye view our neighborhood. And the neighborhood was very dark, except for two homes. And it was my home and my neighbor's home, who I affectionately refer to as the Holy Rollers. They really were good friends, but, uh, and we're really thankful that God used them, but it was those two homes. And in my heart, it showed me that God is with us. He's, he's watching out over us. And I could hardly wait to tell her. And I, I mean, it was, I, w I, you know, no more tears, no more sorrow. It was like, okay, God's got this. I realize this now. And that was the beginning of my journey as a young Christian to realize, you know, God will never leave us or forsake us. And so as um, all of a sudden the door opened, and my wife's coming out, of the, coming out of the bathroom. She's got a smile on her face. She goes, I got something from the Lord. And I said, I did too. <laughs> and I said, okay, you go first, you go first. And she said, God showed me from out on the street our house looking in. And she said, and all around our house was darkness. And out on the street, there were, there were things moving. De I'm, we're assuming demonic activity out on the street. And, and um, that she knew wanted to get in. But around our house, she said, are these gigantic angels that are illuminated brightly, and that's what was lighting up our homes. And, and I, I thought, I told her mine, and then we started crying again. <laughs> it was like, okay, God showed us that he has victory, and that he's, he's going to help us. Now, I wanna make something perfectly clear. He didn't take us out of the trial. He took us through the trial. And uh, it is interesting, my, my wife often, uh, she has this, I don't know where she got it, but she says, God isn't the God of our trials or our circumstance, but he's the God over our trials and circumstances. Isn't that, that's a great way to look at it. But I have had, that, that was on-the-job training. It was kind of like you could prepare to a certain point, but then you're on the job and you're training and God is working with you. And God worked with us in, in these ways. We had no idea where this was all going to lead. I, I had a degree in business. I worked in, uh, for a Fortune 500 company. Um, ministry wasn't on my, um, on my radar. And like I said, I was... Uh, I was just um, uh, a musician before that, trying to make a living, just scratching out a living and playing in all of the clubs I could. In my life, it wasn't anything near being a Christian. And, and as a matter of fact, um, I, it wasn't, that wasn't on my radar, but I'm glad it was on God's radar. I was on God's radar. Um, 
This whole incident reminds me that uh, of Romans 8.31 where it says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Who can be against us? Our God is for us. And I don't know whether there's any of you out there, but if uh, you, you need to remember that your God is for you. Uh, go back and read Jeremiah 29.11. Go read 29.11 because... It says the thoughts that he thinks towards us are thoughts that are, he's for us. He wants us to be successful. And that doesn't mean in worldly things. That means he wants us to be close to him. And when you get, we get strong, it's because we've drawn close to him. We've drawn close to him. Um, I, I, I do truly love this, that... Uh, don't you love to, you guys who teach, don't you love teaching James? <laughs> James is so straightforward. I guess, I guess it's because he was the Lord's earthly brother and he didn't believe in him until he saw the resurrected Christ and he probably said, okay, I'm going for it. There's no time to waste. And he's so straightforward with what he puts out there. But you have to love um, Chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Do you guys really love the trials? Yeah, raise your hand if you love trials. Yeah, there you go. That's, uh, you're a pastor, aren't you? Yeah. See, they, they don't pick the brightest. <laughs> they, 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 but we are good at following orders. Dave's a Marine, so he, uh, or a former Marine. I don't think the brightest either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love James because, you know, most of the time we think about it, we think, I don't like trials. But can I remind you of something? And you know this is true. When you come to the end of that trial and you look back, and you see how God has grown you, don't you take joy in that? To say, God took me through this. He was the Lord over my trial. He took me through it. He, sometimes he had me right by the hand. And when I came to the end of it, he had grown me. I think that's, I think that's uh, one of the most exciting things. Um, and so, like I said, um, hey, some, some trials, you know, Satan isn't under every rock, but he's going to take advantage of everything that happens with us. If we make bad choices, guess what? Guess who's going to be right there? What well, says he's the accuser. Guess what he's saying? He said, oh, look at him now. Look at him now. Look what this guy's doing. So he's the accuser. He's always going to be there manipulating. He's always going to be there. But you know what? But when he hears those words, oh, Lord, Forgive me and help me to become stronger to not do, make these boneheaded decisions again. Guess what it does to Satan? Out of there. That's, that sin's been paid for. Get out of here, buddy. Um, but it's, um, I, I, love, I love this because James goes on to say, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Guys, I want to lack nothing. I want everything God has for me. And, um, and the reason why a lot of us have become pastors is because we're the ones that have to learn patience the most. Uh, uh, you could ask my kids that I've raised five kids. I've got 18 grandchildren. And yes, I'm still alive and kicking to tell you about this. But um, when I was a young father, I wasn't very patient. And uh, I would just say, if God's working in you, let him work the patience because it'll, it'll really work for you well. Um, and also, I love what Paul says, and he, he kind of strengthens this. It says, but we also glory in tribulations. This is Romans 5, 3, and 4. We also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. I can see some of you are to the point where you're learning how to persevere, and some of you are certainly characters, uh, <laughs> but, but then 
from being a character, there's even hope. There's hope. But I love that progression. Produces perseverance, character, and hope. And you know what? I want to have the character of Christ, don't you? That's where I want to be. Um, <clears throat> so our first verse, <laughs> finally be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We need to draw close to Jesus. We need to not just walk with him. We need to pick up and run with him. We need to run with him. It only makes sense. You know, For we've got a lot of runners in the room. I know we have two marathoners in the room. Is there anybody else that runs marathons? Okay. Okay, so they're the ones. <laughs> Uh, my assistant pastor, Ray, back here, and Tim, you run marathons, and I don't know how you guys do it. Um, and I've seen, I've seen Dave, uh, he sends um, pictures where he's on a treadmill, right? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm assuming you're running. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. I, I, the treadmill is about where I get and the elliptical and a few free weights and that's it. But hey, you know what? But, you know, Paul says, you know, if it, you know, when this profits the body a little bit, but doesn't do anything for the inner man. You see, the perseverance, perseverance and being close to the Lord and trying to develop the character that Christ is because we're being turned into his image day by day by day. If what? If we let him do that, let him do the work in us. We have to let him do the work. With, with Glenda and I, this one, you know, he just started doing the work, and we, we kind of went back and said, okay, we're on autopilot now. You go ahead and do it, Lord, because we knew that there were things happening that were beyond our control, and it was something that was happening that was marvelous. But uh, I love that uh, we, need to, we need to be strong in the Lord and in his power. You guys know that he has great power. Philippians 4.13, and you guys are familiar with this. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I want to be strong in that. I want to be strong. I want him to do the work. Um, the other thing is, is the Bible tells us that when, when we receive Christ, when we're born again, when we attain salvation, when we're saved, Whatever you want to call it, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will come and dwell in us and be with us. John 14, 16 through 17 says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, he's telling this to the disciples before he um, goes to the cross, before he ascends, and he's telling them that <clears throat> Holy Spirit is going to be dwelling with you, and it's going to live in you. That's, uh, that's an amazing thing. Um, I, I really love Acts 1, where it really talks about it, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You're going to be witnesses. So can we look at it like this? If you, if you are going through spiritual warfare, if you recognize you're going through spiritual warfare, um, you're in training. You're in training. Now, there's the warfare, right, but you're in training for something much bigger. You're in training to be a witness for God. Every one of us. I, I would dispute with those that say that, um, well, you know, that was just for the apostles or the disciples. Well, wait a minute. It was the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit was given so that the, these, this small group of people could go on and evangelize the whole world and ultimately billions of people would come to know Jesus as their Savior. Are we still doing that? Do we still need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. So, I mean, I don't know who these guys are, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anybody, but you know what? Read the Bible. It's there. It's in plain English. I, I'm really one a, a Calvary Chapel pastor that believes, um, uh, well, one of my 
one of the guys from our church is wearing our t-shirt and on the back what does it say simply teaching the bible simply if god made it hard half of us wouldn't be here let's face it <laughs> right and that includes me but um so it's just really really we need to be strong and we need to recognize that while we're with God, he has the power to give us to be able to do the work. And he has, or if you're saved, he's given you the tools you need right today. Um, verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Um, well, putting on the whole armor, uh, I want I want to, sh- point out to you that here there's two aspects of the armor. There's armor that you put on and there's armor that you take up. So it's an interesting um, interesting separation there in the armor, but, um, and, and Pastor Johnny is going to explain this in great detail from what I understand. Is that right, Johnny? Great detail? I'm gonna get it across. <laughs> what the armor means to us. Well, so Paul's telling the Ephesians, and the Ephesians, remember, they're a Gentile church. They need to be encouraged. They need to be told. They're told who they are in Christ. They're told that we're in unity, and they're told that they're in unity with the church in Jerusalem, the Jewish church, the Gentile church, one church in Christ. They're, they're told who they are to be, and he's encouraging them, and he's exhorting them now that they are going to... Um, they're going to have spiritual warfare, but they're, he's exhorting them to just prepare, be ready. So we put the armor on for protection against the enemy and strike. Have any of you been in close quarters? I don't want to say combat. Let's say um, a fight. You get real close to each other. Have you? Yeah. Did you ever fall down? You knew victory was kind of far from you if you went to the ground, right? <laughs> Your enemy has an advantage being over the top. Not always, but the victory seems to be a little bit odd. When you hit that ground and you see feet flying, you're going, uh-oh, <laughs> this isn't good. But, um, you know, Paul says that we'd be able to, you need to put on your armor so you're able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. And it's interesting that word wiles means scheming. And Jesus identified that, uh, to, that Satan was nothing but a liar and the father of lies, and so scheming is his business. So we, uh, we, we look to Jesus, we look to the word for our authority, right? That's our authority. And we look to it and we say, well, if Jesus said that, it, I believe that. Um, but then we also see that um, Jesus also said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So when before we came to the Lord, we were bound up in the deception of Satan that I'm okay, I'm a good person. Where the Bible says you're not a good person, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, and it shows God's standards. Our standard down here, it's funny. I, I compare myself to others, you know. I'm, I compare myself to, let's say, Tim. And I say, well, I'm better than Tim. <laughs> Every, you know, I'm better than Tim. And God says, well, are you, how are you on this one? And by the way, I overestimate what I am too, right? We all do that. But uh, compared to this, so that's why I need God. I can't live up to God's standards without Jesus. And um, now we come to the important verse. They're all important, but here it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The bottom line is you have to know your enemy. You have to know how your enemy acts. How are we going to know how Satan works? Well, our Bibles are clear who he is and just explain that he's a liar and he comes and he wants to steal and he wants to destroy and we have to know who he is. Um, Knowing our enemy is, is paramount. You know, it says 
This is a dark world we live in. When I was in Vietnam, and like I said, I wasn't a combat soldier, but it, you know, everybody had their take at protecting and, and um, bearing an M16 or a, a grenade launcher or what, even to ba protect your base camp. But um, the enemy didn't always look like what you think. In World War II, where my, my, the people my father's age went to war, you know, you could tell the difference between a German uniform and a U.S. uniform. You could tell the difference between a Japanese uniform and a British uniform. But where I was, you couldn't always tell. Um, they, they looked like normal people. And sometimes the people that we even had working on our base camp uh, during the day to help with, um, help with you know, the, the food and the cleaning and stuff, um, sometimes they would be the ones on the bunker line trying to penetrate and, um, and kill. So you can't always, we didn't always know, but it was important to understand what the enemy would look like, right? You, you, wanted, to, you wanted to understand that you can't just go by looks, you gotta, you gotta go dig deeper than that. So we have to know our enemy. We have to know our enemy, but here's, uh, here's really one of the things that we need to really take to heart. Because this is the hard part. We don't fight against flesh and blood. You see, the enemy is not your boss. The enemy is not your neighbor. The enemy is not all those wackos out there on the road when you're driving home, right? And, and can I just, and I, I say this in seriousness and sadness, the enemy is not your wife. The enemy is Satan. The enemy is the deceiver. And we need, to, we need to come to grips with that. And I know it's hard. Um, my wife said, man, when I married you, everyone on the road had a name. And I said, yeah, like Joe and Sam and Charles. Uh, <laughs> she goes, no, they weren't quite like that. Uh, <laughs> that was before Christ, by the way. <laughs> now I just smile and wave and say, that was dumb. <laughs> and I do dumb things. But we have to understand that this is a spiritual war. What you see in the physical realm, those aren't the enemy. Those are people that were just like us. Do you know that you've probably been a tool of the enemy for someone at some time and didn't realize it because you're manipulated? Maybe your anger got away with you or whatever it might be. Satan is willing to use anyone to, to put somebody else in harm's way or to discourage them. Now... God uses this to grow, right? But I want to I wanna also say that one of the things that the enemy wants to do is because you're a Christian and because of your calling to spread the gospel, you know what the enemy wants to do? He wants you to be ineffective in your work. He wants, he wants to get you on the ground so that you can't do what God has called you to do. And what has God called you to do, guys? called you to lead your home, called you to be a witness for him throughout the world and make disciples of all nations. Now, I know my, my, my brothers here that are going to be teaching, I know all of them are heavily involved in missions just like we are. Missions is the heart of it. But you know what? <clears throat> I'm getting ready to put up a sign on our door, and I talked about this at Bible study this week, that on the front door, as people are walking out, I'm going to put a sign up that says, you are now entering the mission field. Because that's what it does. When we walk out the doors, we've entered the mission field. I have to remind myself. And then finally, in verse 13, it says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Well, what does this say? Well, in my outline, it says it's go time. You know, you condition, you get ready. Then you prepare by putting on the armor. You put on certain parts of the armor for protection. But when it comes, and, th and then you, you've understood, you understand your enemy. <coughs> but lastly, you take up the armor of your warfare, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And now you're ready to be, you're not only ready to defend, but you're ready to take an offensive posture as well. 
And you can't, you've got to, you've got to know your word, guys. Um, I don't know how to express that. You've got to be students of God's word. I don't think you'll regret it. The more I study, the more I love it. I wasn't a good student in high school or college, but this is something that's worthy of our uh, attention. So you need to, it says to withstand. Withstand is an interesting word, and I'm trying to remember. It's in the Greek, if I can pronounce this properly. Antistani, uh, antistani, uh, and that means to to resist, actively resist an opposing pressure or force. So when you have these trials, you're to actively resist it. And it says, doing all you can do to stand. And I'm I'm going to uh, finish here. I know I've gone a little bit over. I promised him I would. Um, <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> um, look, how do we stand, guys? We stand in grace. We stand in the gospel of Christ. We stand in courage and strength. We stand in faith. We stand in Christian liberty. We stand in Christian unity. We stand in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should stand perfect and completely in the will of God. And there's a lot indicated in this one word, stand. It means that we're going to be attacked. And it means that we shouldn't be frightened. We shouldn't be weak. We shouldn't cower. We should rise to the occasion. No self-pity. It means that we are at our position and alert. Because you see, in spiritual warfare, everybody's looking out for everybody else. We're fighting together. We are brothers in Christ. And it means that we not even give a thought of retreat. Not even a thought. And what it means, guys, is the war is real. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for um, we thank you for the trials we have that they mold in us our character, that they give us perseverance, that Lord, they show us that you've never left, left us, you've not forsaken us. But Lord, the amazing thing is that, Lord, we grow in our trials that you can use us. And Lord, I'm just asking right here, right now, that you would use these men in a great way. We thank you, Lord, for this time. And we thank you for your word that shows us how we might live and fight the good fight. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.